a few months ago in the before times, I saw this post on Hacker News mentioning the Turing Pi, a plug-and-play Raspberry Pi cluster that sits on your desk. It caught my attention because, you know, I'm something of a Pi cluster guy myself. I've been running my own old-fashioned Raspberry Pi Dramble cluster since 2015. And today, I'm wrapping up my Raspberry Pi cluster series with my thoughts about the Turing Pi that I used to build a 7-node Kubernetes cluster with K3S. Since 2015, my Pi cluster has gotten better every year, but even now, using the power over Ethernet hat, managing the cabling and physical mounting for the cluster is kind of annoying. So when I saw the Turing Pi and its promise of easy integration with compute modules, I considered placing a pre-order. A couple weeks later, I got an email from one of the Turing Machine's co-founders asking if I'd seen the board before. I said, yes, I have. It, it actually looks really cool. Do you think you could send me one to try it out? Well, he responded with an offer I couldn't refuse. He sent me a prototype board, this Turing Pi 1.1, along with seven compute modules and told me to have some fun with it. And so I did. And in the course of testing it out, I posted a series of videos showing everyone how I installed K3S on the cluster. Then I installed Minecraft server and then proceeded to dig straight down. Recently, Turing machines started producing a big batch of boards. Seriously, check out this video. I think watching pick and place machines do their thing is kind of like ASMR for engineers. Anyways, I thought it would be a good time to post my final thoughts of the Turing Pi after using it for a couple months. So let's get this question out of the way first since it's pretty polarizing. Why would you cluster a bunch of Raspberry Pis together? Isn't it more cost effective and even more power efficient to buy a small NUC or an old laptop? Wouldn't that perform better, especially since you can use a proper SSD and have more ex expansion options? Yes, it would, but is building some VMs on a single computer fun? No, not as much as a little cluster of Raspberry Pis at least. And while the Pi is no speed demon, it's not a slouch either. In episode 5, I compared the performance of the Pi 3 and the Pi 4. Neither Pi CPU could be crowned king over all other processors, but they can do most tasks without much pain. And there are some use cases like energy efficient clustering, where the Pi does actually have a leg up. You can run a cluster of Pis with 28 CPU cores and no fan with half the energy required to run a 60 watt light bulb. Try doing that with any modern Intel CPU. And if you did look at the benchmarks from the previous episode, you might notice the Pi 4 is more than twice as fast as the Compute Module 3B Plus in many ways. So why shouldn't you build a Pi 4 cluster instead of a Turing Pi cluster? Well, for many people, it's still a good option. You might want to stick with a more traditional cluster built on the Pi 4 Model B. But the Turing Pi is built in a way that makes building a Pi cluster a lot easier. Let's go over to the workbench, and I'll walk you through the Turing Pi's hardware. It's built with a mini ITX form factor, and there are two ways to power the board, either through the standard 12-volt barrel plug power supply or a 4-pin ATX power connector. It also has a built-in gigabit network backplane, so that you don't have to integrate a network switch in your build. This makes it easy to mount up to seven Pis fully networked into any off-the-shelf mini ITX case, like the one I have here, and then you can plug in power and a network cable, and that's it for a headless Pi cluster. The master node is the top slot, and you can use it as a management node. You can plug in an HDMI display, keyboard, and mouse, and control the entire cluster from it, no other computer required. And each compute module gets its own 40-pin GPIO header. This board is a development prototype, so it only has a few pins soldered on, but the final board has full 40-pin headers for each Pi, meaning you could integrate multiple Pi hats for many different projects inside one small package. And because of the way the compute modules are built, the slots on the Turing Pi allow hot swapping the Pi, so if you want to replace one or add a new Pi, you don't have to power down the cluster to do it. With the way most people build their traditional Pi clusters, hot swapping would be a long and delicate process, since at least with this kind of setup, you'd have to unmount all the Pis to get to the one you want to replace. And since the Turing Pi uses DDR2 SODIMM slots for the compute module, it's compatible with all the versions of the compute module, from the original model to the newer compute module 3 or 3+. The Turing Pi also includes a cluster management bus. So if you log into the master node, that's this one on top, and you enable its I2C interface, you can manage a number of hardware level options for each compute module. You can manage the onboard network backplane. 
You can power on and off individual compute modules, and you can configure the onboard real-time clock that has a battery backup. The Turing Pi also has flexibility for boot options. Each of the seven slots gets a micro SD card slot attached, and four of them have dedicated USB 2. The second, fourth, and sixth nodes here, here, and here. So with the compute module allowing eMMC storage as an option, you can choose from three different ways to boot the Pi, depending on how much you want to spend or what your performance goals are. And the Pi compute module can also be booted over the network, so you can either have one Pi run a NAS and boot all the others, or you could have another NAS on your network store the boot data for all the Pis. One thing I don't like about the Turing Pi is that the board doesn't have a lot of user-friendly labels and markings. Now you can use this micro USB port to flash the compute module in slot 1, but it's not labeled. The jumper that controls how this port works right here isn't labeled either. Compare that to this Pi Zero. The Pi Zero is tiny, yet it still has labels printed on the board for all the major parts. It would be nice if there were at least labels near every port and all the jumpers so you didn't have to look at the documentation to see what everything goes to. Another thing that would be nice to have is a fan connector in case you wanted to install the Turing Pi in an enclosure that needed active cooling. And a plug for a power indicator and power button would also be nice so you could integrate the Turing Pi with a mini ITX case like this one which has buttons and status lights. And finally, I heard there might be a possibility of an I.O. shield that goes right here for the Turing Pi, though there isn't one out yet. That would make the back of this case look even a bit nicer when the Turing Pi is installed inside of it. All in all, the board is put together well, and I didn't have any hardware-related issues to speak of. I'd assume the final production board that's being shipped now is even better quality, since you can see here this board has had some history. Somebody hadn't soldered a jumper to fix the operation of this voltage regulator chip. For all this flexibility, what good is it if it doesn't perform well? Well, the Turing Pi allows any of the compute modules to perform to their fullest capability. The CPU is only constrained by the fact that the compute module is clocked at a maximum of 1.2 GHz. And that's not a limitation of the Turing Pi, it's because the DIMM slot connections can't provide enough power using the compute module's current design to support faster clock speeds. And the USB and network connections are constrained by the fact that the compute module's system on a chip shares a bus for those two connections. But the built-in gigabit network on the Turing Pi means each compute module can use its full 100 megabits of network bandwidth simultaneously. That's something that I tested in the previous benchmarking video. But as I mentioned in that benchmarking video, if you're strictly looking for the best performance possible with a Pi, the Pi 4 is currently a lot faster for most tasks. The Turing Pi suffers in performance mainly due to the constraints of the older system on a chip the compute module uses. The board itself performs well, and even without a fan I never had any issues with thermal throttling, even when running benchmarks for a few hours. Here's a video I recorded of the Turing Pi booting that I took with my Seek thermal camera. Probably some of the reason the temperature control is so good is because the processor is underclocked, so it doesn't get quite as hot as the chip and the regular Pi 3B Plus did. The Turing Pi also does well when it comes to energy consumption. While booting, I measured about 15 watts of power consumption at 0.2 amps and 120 volts using a kilowatt. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I couldn't get any access to better power measurement devices, so the numbers may be a little bit off with the kilowatt, but in general, this board uses even less power than a separate network switch and Raspberry Pi 4s like I use in my Dramel cluster. Compared to even a single Intel computer or old laptop that performs the same or a little better than the Turing Pi, the Turing Pi is usually going to get the crown when it comes to energy efficiency, if that's your main concern. But I think there are two main reasons you might hesitate buying a Turing Pi. The price and shipping delays. The board costs $189 and has been delayed in shipping mainly due to the pandemic. The Turing Pi isn't the only hardware device I'm interested in that's been having delays either. Ars Technica mentioned last month that the Pinebook Pro was delayed partly because their manufacturing QA process was stalled by the pandemic. From my conversations with the staff at Turing Machines, that's the main reason they've had to delay shipment. They wanted to iron out all the little issues so the final production board worked perfectly before they started shipping them out. If they don't do that, then you might end up with some boards having strange and weird hardware issues and nobody likes flaky hardware. That's something that plagued early shipments of the Pinebook Pros, so I'm glad that Turing Machines is doing the work now to get the Turing Pi right, and it sounds like that process is almost over. Even still, if you want to get a Pi cluster up and running quickly today, 
it's probably going to be faster to buy and put together all the parts for a Pi 4 cluster like my Pi Dramble. But say you like all the things the Turing Pi has to offer. Why does it cost almost $200 and is that even a good price? Well, that's a complicated question. I spoke with someone from Turing Machines about why the board is $189, and the main reason is there are a few expensive parts on the board, like the DIMM connectors and the individual Ethernet controller chips. If you look at the Raspberry Pi itself, it's a product that couldn't hit its low price point without saving a few pennies here and there with every design decision. And the Turing Pi is the same way, except instead of talking about all the parts to make one computer, you're putting together parts for seven computers. So if you find a good chip that costs $5, like the LAN 9514 chip on the underside of the board that's used for the network interfaces on the Turing Pi, you're looking at a $35 cost in those chips alone. Pair that with the expensive and hard to source 200 pin vertical SODIMM connector the compute module uses, which costs $10 each, and you're already at over $100 in parts per board. And that's not including the 300 plus other components on the board, much less the R&D and production costs. So in the end, is $189 a good price? Well, yes and no. Due to limitations of the compute module, it's kind of a minimum floor for the price of a board like this. And I'm guessing Turing Machines isn't making a massive profit either. Their margins are probably pretty thin on this board. So it's a good price for the hardware and form factor you're getting, but if you're only interested in getting the best performing Pi cluster for the money, you'd probably still be better off with a Pi 4. Before I wrap things up, I also wanted to congratulate Matthias from Germany, who won the Turing Pi that Turing Machines gave away for my channel reaching 30,000 subscribers. I asked Matthias what he planned on doing with the Turing Pi that he won, and he said he's going to try to get K3S running following the tutorial that I gave, and then install Pi-hole and Home Assistant and maybe also a VPN. Congratulations on winning the Turing Pi, and I hope it ships to you soon. I know that there are a lot of people who are eagerly awaiting their pre-orders too. Thank you for watching this series. If you liked it, please subscribe to the channel because there's a lot more great content coming this year about Raspberry Pis, Kubernetes, Ansible, and more. If you want to keep me trying out new and crazy things with Raspberry Pis, please consider sponsoring me on GitHub or Patreon so I can afford it. There are links for that in the description below. Until next time, I'm Jeff Geerling.